Welcome everyone to the 2015 Sharon Plow Executive Lecture Series. This year's series is titled Communication at Work, where we have asked each of the lecturers to focus on the communication practices that are central to their work, be it their research or their professional work, and to talk about what they do, how it works, and engage the audience to consider how they might apply it to their own lives and work. Today's lecture comes to us from Dr. Paul Denver of the Albany College of Pharmacy and Health Sciences. I know Paul from the National Communication Association, whose national, uh, annual national conference brings together scholars from all areas of communication studies, and we're both active scholars and participants in the language and social interaction division. So I've seen Paul present his work and respond to others' work since he was a graduate student. I don't mean to sound like I'm your mother or something, but uh, I've seen his work evolve into a fascinating combination of theory and practice. And particularly, he looks at currently patient-provider practice in a variety of communication contexts. And what I like about his work is that he never just looks at the clinical aspects of communication in this or other context, but looks at how people relate to one another, how they do identity and face work, and those other areas of communication studies that make our work distinctive from, let's say, applied linguistics, sociology, and other fields that feed into this kind of work. Paul and I have both been trained as conversation analysts, so we have studied with some of the same scholars, we need Pomerantz among them, and I think what uh, we share in common in our work, and the reason why I wanted to invite him here, is that he studies conversation beyond the level of the structure of the interaction to engage these issues of relationship, identity, culture, institutions, and the like. So today he's going to talk to us about patient-centered healthcare teamwork, addressing how we who are participants in that realize that and what are the challenges and strategies for doing patient-centered healthcare teamwork. Paul comes to us from the Albany area. He has driven all the way down here to visit with us, and that is where he's done his undergraduate and graduate work in a variety of disciplines, public communication, communication, and sociology. So I ask you to please welcome Paul Denver. Thanks so much, Kathleen. It's a real pleasure to be here. Um, I know we're on a little bit of a tight time table, so I'm going to just kind of jump right in. Quick overview of the talk I have for today. I want to talk a little bit about my scholarship and my research program just so you understand um, kind of how I'm approaching some of these issues. Um, I'll talk a bit about that. And, and I think I'll quickly go through qualitative methodologies. I'm assuming for this audience um, there's some familiarity, probably maybe for the graduate students who are also high graduate students. Thanks so much for tuning in. Uh, maybe a little bit of exposure there. I'll talk about some key projects and productivity that I've been doing over the last few years. And I think it's really important to leave some time at the end to talk about my future projects because I think those are particularly relevant to the question of healthcare teamwork. In some ways, I've been working on a couple different threads that are leading us to that place. And I think that would be particularly relevant for the pharmacy folks who are in the audience here as well. So starting with my scholarship. When I uh, sort of and took my first professional job, I had four specializations. And I'm going for a bit of a funnel approach here, starting broad, and then I'll get you know, closer and closer to what I'm working on right now. So four specializations, health communication, interpersonal communication, intercultural, and qualitative methodologies. And I translate that into a research program, which um, I think it's useful, actually, if you can express your research program in a sentence. It was actually really challenging to find just the right sentence. But for me, this captures the essence of what I'm working on. The goal of my research program is to identify and analyze interpersonal communication challenges in healthcare settings and to develop strategies for addressing those challenges. And within that, I think it's important to note that this is how I define myself as an applied uh, communication scholar or an applied health communication scholar. There's absolutely nothing wrong, and in fact, there's lots of things that are great about sort of basic, descriptive work and analysis, and I love those kinds of things. Uh, but I've definitely taken on the mission of thinking about how I can use my training and my uh, analytic lens to enhance practice, to make things better. Um, so in that sense, the challenges and strategies framing is, a, is something you'll see you know, throughout today's presentation in any project that I'm working on. So if we take that basic statement of a research program, I want to break that down into a couple of areas. So an area of strength for me is provider-patient communication. Uh, early on, that was physician-patient communication. 
um, as Kathleen alluded to, that has now moved into pharmacist patient communication, and I continue to sort of work in those areas. More recently, I've started looking at the question of interprofessional collaboration. Sometimes it's called interdisciplinary collaboration, but essentially the question is, how do you get professionals from different disciplines, let's say in a healthcare team, we've got a physician who's got their own training and background and agenda, mm -hmm. and a pharmacist and a dietitian and a physical therapist and you know mental health counselors, social workers, you know, these are all people who are talked about as part of the modern healthcare team, but they are radically different kinds of professionals. In some ways, I think uh, the way that healthcare teamwork has evolved is the idea is all we need to do is get these people in the same room or in the same building, and then we just sort of shake it up, and magical, great properties of practice emerge from that. And I think what communication can bring to the table is frankly putting the brakes on that a little bit and saying, actually, no, this is a problem we need to figure out. We need to figure out how pharmacists and physicians talk to each other. We need to figure out how a dietitian and a social worker, how their disciplinary training interfaces and how they can communicate productively on behalf of the patient. So that's something I'm really working on is, in a good way, problematizing healthcare teamwork and trying to find out what are the ingredients that can make this work. Where that's all leading, again, that's sort of patient provider background, the interprofessional collaboration, where I want to get to and where, I, the, the, where I'm going to lead today is on a project that I'm collecting data for right now, which I think is the best realization back to my title of the idea of patient-centered healthcare teamwork. All right, so trying to bring these two threads together to look at the team. And what's important about that is the modern conceptualization of the healthcare team includes the patient. Right? The patient is not the object of care. The patient is on the team. Moreover, the patient's family and caregivers are on the team. Okay? So this image that we have of patient-centered healthcare teamwork is about more than just um, providers working with each other, though that's essential. I'm kind of a fan of visual communication when I can find a simple, elegant image that I think captures a lot. I like it. Um, this doesn't capture everything, but I did like this. And this is just from a Google image search. You can find images that are just like it. Um, ways of trying to visually capture the idea of healthcare teamwork. So I just want to point out maybe a couple things about this that I think are powerful. So the red figure in the center is the patient. I know maybe we're a little bit washed off in the light, but you can see that central figure is red. That's the patient. The blue characters around that are the providers. And so on the one hand, maybe it looks a little scary to be surrounded in this way by providers, but I think what they're trying to show with this is the idea of care is being provided for the patient from these different spokes of the healthcare system. The patient is at the center of this. You can also see in this that the providers have uh, a kind of a mediated relationship with each other through the patient. I mean, this is not meant to imply separate spheres of influence on the patient, but rather kind of a spoken hub model, right, where maybe this is a physician and a pharmacist. They have a relationship with each other, a working relationship, but it's directed through the patient and the patient's needs. So I actually really like this as sort of a visual metaphor, metaphor for modern healthcare teamwork. A sort of a patient surrounded by caregivers who have an independent relationship with the patient, but also mediated relationships with one, with one another through the patient. All right, so a bit about qualitative methodologies. And again, I don't, I don't think the purpose of the talk should be to get into a lot of detail about this. I just want to give you a bit of a picture because the studies that I want to show you and the work that I'm doing is going to be sort of rooted in these traditions. So I just want to give you a bit of a background. So as Kathleen mentioned, we're both trained in conversational analysis and I think to some extent also uh, discourse analysis. Um, I think it's a bit of inside baseball, I think, the differences between conversational analysis and discourse analysis. And some people in those camps would, you know, fight to the death for the sort of distinctiveness of those traditions and they can have that fight if they want it. I mean, I think both approaches are really useful. What they have in common is the idea of looking at talk and interaction. I mean, that's, I think, the essence uh, of both, although discourse analysis is maybe a little less committed to interaction, but still looking at talk and its, and its deployment in social situations. So the idea is direct observation of social interaction. There's absolutely nothing wrong with survey research. In fact, there's lots that's great about it. Maybe people in this room do survey research. I have ideas about survey research that I'd like to do. But I do think it's worth pointing out that there's a lot of communication research which actually doesn't look at communication itself. It's a lot of asking people about what they do when they communicate. It's um, sort of a social psychological approach. And again, that's absolutely fantastic and wonderful answers to big questions. Um, sort of not my background, not my training. All right? I really have one of the appealing things to me about CA and DA is the idea of let's actually look at this thing we're trying to study. Let's look at communication. What are people actually doing with each other, not what are they talking about, uh, not how they report on or fill little bubbles to tell us what happens. Okay. It has value, but 
Uh, for me, this always had a real strong appeal when I became a communication person. Methods that meant looking at communication itself. I think this gives you access to external behavior, but one of the shortcomings is no access to internal cognition, meaning uh, sort of ideas, thoughts, perspectives. Do I like what's going on or do I not? CA doesn't necessarily give you great access to that. The idea is to identify and analyze microstructures and processes, and that's done by looking at audio, video recordings, and detailed transcriptions. This is a quick sort of overview. There's, there's a little more complexity to it. I also use ethnography of communication, and I want to offer that this is a really nice complement, actually, to more of a CA or DA kind of approach. So there the idea is getting at community members' experiences and perspectives regarding communication. Mostly I do in-depth interviewing, and so the way that I frame this is, I think, informed by my interest in interviewing. There's a nice, if you will, yin and yang, or complementarity between these approaches. If you, if you think in terms of what it means to interview someone, is to try to get access to how they are thinking about and experiencing things. And that's, it, for me, that's a great way to triangulate how you understand something. On the one hand, ask them what's going on, how they're experiencing it, and on the other hand, watch them do it. Watch what actually happens. And that's a really nice way to get at it. So it gives us access to something internal, something experiential, but not necessarily an external behavior. Uh, with one exception, as I say here, it's in-depth interviewing and participant observation. Participant observation does, in fact, give you access to external behaviors, so it's just not something I have as much experience with. The goal there is to identify and analyze members' language, concepts, and meanings. I think at the heart of both of these approaches is the idea of social constructionism, that we make social reality out of the ways that we talk about it, which is a, it sounds like some sort of radical postmodern thing, but it's actually, I feel it's a very concrete idea to, to contemplate. I mean, right now, we are all communicating with each other to uh, achieve a colloquium or a talk. I mean, everything in your behavior is to achieve audience membership in this event. And everything I'm doing, including where I'm standing and everything I'm doing, is socially constructing the talk. We can socially construct this at a moment's notice as something else if we decided to. If I had a little Nerf ball and I threw it to Gary, Suddenly we're not doing a colloquium anymore, we're doing something else. We have socially constructed some other event. So rather than seeing it, you know, any, anything social as this inexorable thing, like of course this is a colloquium in this beautiful place, it's this talk that happens in it that socially constructs it to be what it is. Right? And I think that's the thing that really coheres these two methods. They're both methods that are committed to that idea that what an event is is what the people make it to be. All right, I'm going to just kind of go through this slide um, very, very quickly because I think it's not, you know, if you've had training in communication, you've already gone to grad school and you've had the qualitative versus quantitative battles and uh, that was a big part of like, my identity in grad school. I'm a qualitative person, uh, you know, and qual quantitative people say, numbers, it's the numbers, that's too anecdotal and, you know, you get over it basically. I think you get a job and you go, this is silly, uh, that's kind of a grad school, you know, kind of, um, professional experience to sort of think about your methods in this really identity duplicative way. The best advice I ever got was when I was just finishing up grad school and a sociology professor said, you know, think of it this way. Think of it as, um, they're just horses. You know, put them out on the track and let them run. Let them see what they get you. Don't worry about what's better or what's worse. Just let them run. And that, that, that felt like it was fantastic advice to me. I do qualitative research because it's what I'm trained in. I think it yields useful things. I'm kind of not interested in the qualitative and quantitative wars anymore. Though I do think it's important to understand what each thing brings to the table. I think ultimately the only point I want to make for today is that both approaches yield empirical, evidence-based social scientific findings. So different ways of getting at the same thing. Uh, the only thing I want to contest is the idea that qualitative is just one person's opinion, that it's not empirical or it's not evidence-based. As, as I'll try and show, I mean, all claims are grounded in data. The data are textual as opposed to numerical. That doesn't change the fact that you know, uh, it is empirical, it is based in evidence. All right, some key projects in productivity. I want to start by uh, sharing uh, just a snippet of a study I did on provider patient communication. This one happens to be physician patient communication, though I think it would be applicable to really any kind of provider. Some, pr some publications and presentations I've done in the area of provider patient. This is the one that I want to talk a bit about. This one was published in uh, Social Science and Medicine in 2012. I have a long-standing interest in anything that strikes me as socially or culturally delicate or sensitive or tricky for people to talk about. Um, I'm just sort of attracted to that. I don't know what it is exactly. I tend to think it's because I'm a communication person and it feels like those are situations where they really need us. When talk itself is the problem, when how to speak to each other well is the problem, so that's where I want to be as a communications scholar. That's where I want to be working. 
So when people say we have a hard time talking about this because it's sensitive or delicate, I want to say, okay, great. How can we do this better? Again, the challenges and strategies framing looms large for me in lots of ways. In primary care, one of the things that's quite tricky to talk about is what are often called lifestyle topics. And there's, that's a wide range of things, but in general, it's captured by uh, diet, exercise, uh, substance use, and sexual activities, all right, those four things. Relevant to health in, in, in myriad ways, I won't get into them all right now, I'll trust you have a sense of it, but these are things that are routinely asked about, but are also routinely under asked about, and that's kind of the complaint. Uh, patients don't tend to bring these things up, providers tend to really recoil at having to ask about them, or ask about them at the depth at which the medical literature suggests. Uh, so for me, this was attractive, I wanted to find out what's going on here, what are, what are the problems, how can we do these things better. Uh, most of my work is focused on substance use and sexual activities, those two topics, though I would love to follow up later on diet and exercise. And I actually think my connection to pharmacy gives me a great way to look at those things. Um, I think diet actually has comes up a lot in pharmaceutical consultations because it affects your medication use. All right, so I've kind of done a quick version of uh, what the challenges are, but here's some notes to kind of get at it. There's a discrepancy between the recommended frequency and quality of these histories and the actual frequency. So basically, this isn't me as a comm scholar saying, you people aren't talking about this enough. This is the medical literature itself saying, we're not doing a good job at this. We know these things are important. We know we need to give a thorough history. But when we look at the data, we're not. And in various publications, I've shown um, how both absent these discussions are and how superficial they are when they're even there. They're sensitive and difficult for lots of reasons. One of the more interesting ones, I think, is that they straddle medical and moral bases of evaluation, right? Um, you know, if you, uh, you know, if you have some younger friends who talk about the idea of a 30 rack, do you guys know the expression of 30 rack? I didn't either. Oh. These are friends in their 20s. So a 30 rack apparently is, a, is 30 beers, a case of beers, 30 beers, a 30 rack. So having a 30 rack a night or, or on any given night has medical consequences, I think those sort of speak for themselves, but we live in a culture in which those also have moral implications. There's identity wrapped up in what it means to drink a 30 rack or use any substances in ways that are sort of, you know, have moral and moral overlay. Uh, for the record, I mean, I tend to be agnostic on the moral questions as a scholar, I mean, this is not my interest really, but I'm also a scholar who's sensitive to the moral uh, context in which these things are talked about, okay? So what makes it sensitive in some ways is the fear of judgment. And there's lots of literature that shows that patients don't want to be judged. They don't mind getting medical advice, but they don't want to be judged. That word judgment comes up a lot um, when you look at sensitive topics in a health context. And for the, for the record, providers don't want to be seen as judging. Part of the reason they don't want to be thorough is because they feel like to be thorough is to look like somehow you're judging or scolding patients. So finding ways to ask in ways that are medically relevant but don't seem to get into morality would be their uh, goal, but it's tricky. It's a tricky, tricky business. The other aspect of lifestyle that I think is important is the agency or choice. Okay, um, you know, there's aspects of health that don't aren't tied up really in choice making. I mean, you get the flu because you get the flu, right? Lifestyle topics, you know, if you're, you know, various health problems. If you contract an STD or STI, excuse me, if you are obese, uh, these are things that people. Again, I'm not. I'm not uh, I'm not you know, aligning with or disaligning with these claims, but there's a sense that somehow you are culpable for health problems that are tied to your choice making. And that's one of the things that's really definitional of lifestyle. Um, they are not, they don't happen to you, they happen because of you. And that idea that's, that pervades our culture, I think, shapes how people talk about these matters. Research has addressed structural, attitudinal, and educational basis for this discrepancy between what we should be doing and what we are doing. My research looks at interactional bases. So what actually happens when people interact, right? Structural, attitudinal, educational things. These all happen before you actually have a provider and patient together, okay? One of the things I think we're used for a communication person to do is let's look at what happens when they are together. What can make that challenging or problematic? In this piece, what I end up planning, and I actually have another piece that's um, under review, and I'm hoping to hear any day that it's going to be accepted, fingers, fingers crossed, I hope, uh, in communication and medicine, where I sort of a companion piece. So I want to sort of talk a little bit about both things. One of the things that I argue in both pieces is the idea that when patients report on their substance use, there is a stance that is visible in their talk. They are not merely informing or merely describing. They are taking a stance toward what they're reporting. I saw two different kinds of stances in my data. One stance was, 
uh, my substitutes is normal and healthy, or my lifestyle conduct is normal and healthy. The other stance was, and I won't talk about this one today, but if you're interested, I'd be happy to send you the paper in progress. When patients take the stance that actually this might be problematic, patients have ways of indicating that, and they do. They say they have ways indirectly and implicitly of saying, I realize what I'm about to tell you probably isn't great, and then they will report it. Um, so those two stances both have different implications for what a provider would do. What I want to show you today is an example of the normal healthy stance. And I chose intentionally what I think is a very mundane case. I mean, I have more, <laughs> if you will, sort of flashy cases or people reporting all kinds of crazy things. But I think that's not actually the point. I think to, to really see this phenomenon, it's better to find it in more mundane cases. So I'm actually going to quickly play the data. Um, when we were testing this ahead of time, it was a little bit quiet, so I don't know how loud it will be. It's not a super loud recording, but we'll do our best. You're going to notice that as it starts up, it's, they're finishing up a little discussion about uh, smoking, and then we'll shift into this quick sequence here on drinking. I never see, I might have a bunch of, 
right. a bunch of beers. <laughs> a bunch of doesn't do that job. A bunch of is a maximizer. A couple of is a minimizer. Right? So these subtle choices that say, uh, you know, it is normal, it is safe, you know, not to worry. Every now and then, once in a while, again, these are frequency uh, uh, approximations that say infrequent and thus unproblematic. When is the morally appropriate place to drink? On the weekend, of course. Why? You know, you're free from work responsibilities, so it doesn't mean it's, it's not compromising your work productivity. There's social events, social gatherings. By the way, that's another one I have a ton of. Um, explicit mentions of social drinking. Just that word alone. You know, do you drink? Yeah, you know, socially. You get that a lot. Uh, again, socially, it's, it's, I think, built on the idea that most of us know. What's, what is the kind of number one canonical warning sign of problem drinking? Drinking alone, right? So to say you drink socially is to say it's not that kind of drinking. It's the good kind of drinking socially with friends at bars, on occasion, you know, at a wedding. We have all these ways of pointing to um, times when it's culturally appropriate to drink. And by the way, that's one of the ways in which the cultural dimension of my training comes through. Is think that I mean I, I invite you to see how much culture is embedded in this. Uh, the idioms are fully cultural. The notion of you know a couple of what beers means. Culturally, it's very different. Um, I was just at NCA and I saw a paper by a uh, psychologist, uh, defender of dissertation, Elena Nusifora, which she studied Russian drinking. And their beer is irrelevant, it's vodka. You know, that's their drink. So, again, it's a small point, but I want to invite you to see that these, what you drink and how and when and with whom is culture, deeply and richly cultural. And that's all. Um, I've always, always found this to be an interesting little tag on the end of the report. I think it could mean two different things. The one I think that it means is um, that's all I have to say about it at this moment. Like that's, there's nothing else to report. That's that's the end of it. That's the scope of my drinking. At times I've wondered if she's playing off of a hot couple or something like that, and that's all. And part of what she's trying to convey is the idea of an orientation to an upper limit, which is another sort of way of showing good kinds of drinking. I know I've had enough. A couple or something like that, and that's all. In other words, I can cut myself off. I've never quite decided which one I'm sort of more invested in, but the great thing about this kind of analysis is you don't have to be, right? Talk is multifunctional. Talk can do multiple things, independent of what the speaker may have intended, right? It can function um, in, in ways that aren't programmed in. But finally, I want to talk um, a little bit about, uh, make more of a kind of a sequential or a structural point. It has to do with the relationship between the question format and the response that you get. So I didn't have a ton of physicians who did this in this in this project, but this this physician used this formulation a lot. She would use what I would call an identity-based formulation. Are you a drinker? That's, in my, in my opinion, a suboptimal way to inquire about substance use. It says, would you put yourself in this category, this identity category, or not? Are you one of those, or are you not one of those? And that's problematic on the face of it. I think it's especially problematic when the category you're asking the patient to assign him or herself to has these connotations. Right? Um, a drinker doesn't just mean one who drinks. I think it has associations with heavier drinking or problem drinking. And you know, sometimes I explain this I, when I point out this way of speaking. I, I usually people can think of you know are familiar with it. You know, the idea of oh, oh you know, Pat is a bit of a drinker. Right? When we say that, we don't mean he's one who consumes alcohol. We mean something problematic in the drinking. So drinker means something beyond just one who drinks. It's got a, a sort of heavier connotation. And so that's an especially problematic usage. One of the things that you notice in this case, and in other cases where she uses this, is the patient pretty strongly, you know, in terms of the baseline of how patients speak, pretty strongly rejects that formulation. I'm not a heavy drinker, not like that. Okay, which, in my you know, view, is responsive to this formulation of are you a drinker, right? Before she even really finishes the formulation of her drinking, she rejects, I'm not a heavy drinker. And that uh, implication is available in the question, are you a drinker? And she works to reject that implication in the way that she reports what she actually is doing. So to kind of pull this together, when patients enact these normal healthy stances, completely understandable, I and mean, I'm not critiquing that, but it can be difficult for the physician who's trained to press for more details and for whom the medical literature is telling them Ask more. Ask more questions. There's all you know. There's all these different screening instruments and five questions you should ask, right? And often don't get asked. So the literature says, look for precise numbers. You can actually help patients, you know, by saying things. Hey, when we spoke last year, last year's checkup, you were estimating, you know, three or four drinks a week. 
today you told me six or eight, you know, is it going in that direction? Is it you know anything you want to talk about? You can't do that without some kind of quantification. If you don't have three and four and six and eight, you can't do that. So it's good record keeping in some ways to be able to arrive at some sense of the number. It's good to ask about heavy episodic drinking. What used to be called binge drinking, now it's referred to as heavy episodic drinking. It's actually one of the better predictors of, or risk factors for developing a more systemic drinking problems if you have episodes of heavy, heavy episodic drinking. So just inquiring about that, finding out what your background is, is useful. Almost never gets asked. And then past issues. Um, have you ever had any issues in the past with substance use? Almost never gets asked, particularly if it's a normal healthy frame. Right? So part of what it is here is to take a normal healthy stance is to say, no problem, nothing to see here. For a provider, how do you dig when that's the stance that you're being shown? If you do dig, patients may wonder, does my doctor not believe me? Do I seem like I have a problem? Do I seem somehow like I'm an alcoholic? Is that why I'm getting the third degree here? So some of the strategies, and back to the challenges and strategies framing, some of the strategies I recommend in this piece is to appreciate that patients have agendas of their own during history taking. Uh, uh, actually a mouthful. It's a, something that's not been, um, I think, fully embraced in provider-patient interaction literature, but more so, I think, we are lately. Uh, that, that patients have projects. There's two possible projects that I think are worth appreciating here. One is, and I think this is, you know, kind of the central one, patients can work to enhance rapport with their providers. Rapport is not just the provider's responsibility. If it's a therapeutic alliance, and that's the way we're talking about it, it's a team, it's perfectly reasonable, I think, for patients to do some identity work or face work. Show a provider that I'm sensible in my conduct. I'm thoughtful. I'm health conscious. I'm mindful of doing things a good way. And that is not, as it is often seen, some kind of um, sneaky attempt to mis mislead the provider or hide what's true. Sometimes that may happen. I prefer to see it as a way of investing in the healthcare partnership, of saying, I'm a you know good patient. I'm working hard. I'm thoughtful. I'm smart. You know. I check WebMD, I know what good practices are. You know, working in those ways, I think, is a reasonable agenda for patients to have. The other thing I think that's worth pointing out in terms of agenda is, you know, patients will get to see their physicians all the time. They, you know, often we have, what, 15 minutes maybe, um, or less, even a comprehensive history and physical, sometimes it's half an hour. I think it's reasonable if a patient's analysis is, I don't have a substance use issue or problem, I'll answer the question, but I'm going to answer it in a way that kind of wraps it up and says, nothing to see here. Now can we talk about this terrible back pain that I've had all year and I can't resolve, right? So for patients to say, I don't want to spend time on that, I want to reserve the time I have for this, is actually a form of patient agency right? and empowerment. And I think we want to appreciate that as well, that patients can influence and shape what, uh, we, what we talk about during a consultation, and that is reasonable. I also recommend avoiding identity-based initial question formats of um, smoker, drinker, drug user in favor of activity-based formats. Right? So do you drink alcohol? Uh, generally, that will invite patients to share the specific details in a way that's safer than asking them, are you in this category? Are you one of those people? Which uh, creates lots of problems, as we saw. And finally, use prefaces prior to lifestyle history taking. Uh, the idea of a preface is to say something at time A that resists problems that could emerge at time B. Right? So you're getting out in front of the inferential problems that might come. And so I offer a couple of different kinds of prefaces. And these are a little bit overbuilt. I think providers can develop them in ways that are suited to the situations that they're in. But if there's concerns about moral judgment, I mean, rather than just crossing your fingers and hoping patients don't go there, try to say something that gets out in front of that. I have a few questions about substance use. I just want you to know that I'm not here to judge. My job is to provide care, and I can do that better when I have a clear picture of your day-to-day -day lifestyle. All right, so put morality on the table so you can swipe it off the table. Say, that's not my job, that's not what I do. Okay? That's not often said enough. And by the way, I think with these prefaces, a lot of times you hear providers saying, well, we don't have time for that. Um, it seems like providers never have time to do the kind of uh, soft skills things that like, communication people think is so important, but I think they're wrong about that. And I think, frankly, if you do a preface like this, you actually are saving time in all of the delicate maneuvering, maneuvering and machinations that happen when somebody's offended or feels skeptical or feels scared. That that's when um, interaction isn't productive. That's when you don't feel like you can tell the truth. Right? And what is more productive than dealing with an accurate medical history? What is more efficient than getting the truth out? Right? So if you can take the morality out of the table, you're going to get better information and provide better care. I also think it's important to be able to project a series of questions, to be able to get to that binge drinking question, perhaps. Um, and also to depersonalize it. So here's a little script that captures both of those things. I like to ask all of my patients the same four or five questions about substance use. 
it's important to be thorough, so I tend to ask all these questions every time, even if what you tell me sounds pretty low risk from a health standpoint. So the depersonalizing piece, just a simple move of saying, I like to ask all of my patients, is a way of saying, this isn't about you, you don't look like an alcoholic to me, I just, this is what I do for everybody, is a way for a patient to feel like if they're getting the third degree, it's for this reason. It's because it's standard practice, not because they've earned it somehow and how they've answered the questions. So it buys you, if you will, the right to ask a series of questions. Um, the series of questions part, um, again, makes, you know, when that third question, when that binge drinking question comes up, it comes up because it's protocol, not because you're being judgmental. So there's a weird way we talk so much about personalized medicine. I think there's a little interesting irony there, and that sometimes what is patient-centered is to depersonalize what you're doing. It's to say we do this for everybody. Interesting twist, I think. All right, interprofessional collaboration, and here we'll start to get into some of the pharmacy research that I've done. Um, this is the piece that I'm going to talk a bit about. Um, you see the name uh, Brewer up there. That's my colleague Jeffrey Brewer, who's a pharmacist and a pharmacy preceptor at Albany College of Pharmacy and Health Sciences. Has always been interested in communication, and we collaborated on this whole project. And I have to say, um, I know it's apropos to the setting here, but I have found it incredibly useful to partner with a healthcare provider to do this kind of research. Not only, I mean, can he answer simple questions like, uh, what the heck is lisinopril and what do you use it for? What are they talking about here? Why, why are they disagreeing about this? I mean, I could spend days looking through pharmacy databases to try to find that out. Or I could say, hey, Jeffrey, what's lisinopril? What's going on in this case? And he can really explain it to me in a way that's simple and elegant and accessible. It's, you know, a great example of research-based teamwork where his strengths and my strengths really work together. Um, but he also has clinical instincts, and he can sometimes tell me stories and backstories about what I see in the data that I just don't have access to, and he can contextualize things. Anyway, so this was uh, this is actually an interview study. I interviewed uh, uh, 35 student pharmacists and 15 pharmacy preceptors. If you don't know that term, so a preceptor is sort of like, it's the version of an attending physician. I right? talk about resident physicians are supervised by attending physicians. Student pharmacists are supervised by precepting pharmacists, so they are the PharmD that is running a clinical site and taking students under them. So essentially, I talk to the pharmacy learners and the pharmacy professionals about all aspects of communication, professionalism, interprofessional collaboration, patient provider communication, really rich, in-depth interviews. Uh, the average length of the interviews is about an hour and 15 minutes, which I'm actually really proud of. Uh, most of the research that I read in HealthCom they're able to get, you know, especially if it's on providers of any kind, I mean, they're happy to get a 15-minute interview. And that's a good interview in that context because, you know, providers are busy. So, again, being at a college of pharmacy or a college that has a pharmacy program, these are my friends, these are my colleagues. They're, you know, next door to me. I can, you know, hit them up to talk to me for an hour and a half about these things. Actually, one pharmacist gave me a two-hour and 15-minute interview. Uh, and it's, it was an incredible and rich interview. And so. Collaborations naturally emerge when you work together because they're your neighbors, they're your colleagues. Even though I had this background in patient interaction, when I started looking at the data, the stuff that was getting me the most excited was the students talking about working with physicians, kind of the interprofessional teamwork part of things. And it was really a stressful thing for them. Um, it was on their mind a lot how to interact well with physicians. And, and frankly, it came up a lot in interviewing the pharmacists as well, the preceptors. But for, for this piece, um, really focusing on the students, the learners. Oh, pardon me, let me go back here. It seemed to me that the most delicate and sensitive, and therefore for me, the most fascinating thing to look at was when student pharmacists, by virtue of their um, role in a, in a rotation, had to give a recommendation to a physician. Right? Uh, we, uh, patients shouldn't be on this drug, should be on that drug. I'll get more detail about this as we go forward. But that's what I mean by a recommendation, a therapeutic recommendation. I want to start with a case, and then I'll get into some more notes uh, on this. I think the case will speak volumes about what is interesting about these, uh, these data. This is a student pharmacist who was out on what's called an uh, APPE, A-P-P-E rotation, Advanced Pharmacy Practice Experience. It's akin to rotations for, um, for medical residents. So I had a doctor that put a patient on, let's say, penicillin. I don't know what it was, but it was something very general that treats most things, and it came back resistant, and there was another medication that would have treated it better. I'm sorry, this is the hospital setting too, I meant, I meant to mention that, hospital pharmacy. And then the precepting pharmacist says to me, oh, why don't you page him and let him know that he's got to change it, because, I mean, we can't change the medication. We can only say, hey, we noticed this, and it's sort of, we're helping them out. Like, they're so busy rounding, 
they might not get a chance to look at that report until the next day. And now they've been on antibiotics for two days that aren't doing anything for them. So just, again, a little bit of the, the clinical background. So in the hospital, they get these things called sensitivity reports, which basically tell them, is this antibiotic working on this infection? Uh, if it is, great. If it's not, you change it. Right? The pharmacist got these sensitivity reports back first. They're trying to be proactive in getting this patient the right antibiotic, because the penicillin or the general one was not, um, was not uh, affecting the infection. So I paged him, and he called back the pharmacy, and I answered. The physician was very upset, and he said, how dare you question what I use to treat this patient? I said, you know, we just got the sensitivity report back, and it's saying that it's resistant. And he said, well, isn't that funny? I mean, my patient is getting better. I know what I'm doing. Don't ever question me again. Everyone I talked to had a collection of stories like this. Not one story. Not, oh, well, the, you know, interacting with physicians is wonderful, but this one time I'll never forget. No, this was... Pharmacists have lots of these kinds of stories. I will say, in general, pharmacists said it's wonderful to work with physicians, but this was not an isolated kind of thing. Every pharmacist, and I'm guessing, uh, you know, our, our friend Mike here, has stories like this. Um, and, you know, what's that? Yeah. Um, this is something that happens for pharmacists because of the position they are in in the healthcare team. Uh, they are often the person who catches the error, and they have a tricky problem on their hands here to call this other person who is you know, the healthcare team leader, nobody disputes that, but the physician is the healthcare team leader. How do you sort of tell the leader you did the wrong thing here? That's tricky in myriad ways. And we won't get all into all of it today, but I want to invite you to see that that is tricky business to tell somebody who is a colleague, but also running the show that they made a bad decision. A little um, sort of epilogue here for this particular story. The student was really upset about this. Um, she was just trying to do a good job, and did a good job, in fact, caught it, and had a good recommendation for a better antibiotic, got her head bitten off for it. The next day, they go to morning rounds, and we're bringing the patients, and that you know, physician is there, and she sees immediately that the physician, who had just bitten her head off the day before, in fact, changed it to the one she had recommended, but never said anything in rounds. Didn't acknowledge the change, didn't apologize to the student for biting her head off, didn't thank her for the catch, nothing. All right, so the pharmacy expertise made its way to the patient, enhanced the patient's care, but the interprofessional collaboration was really left sour for the student. And she so much so that she was reluctant to ever make recommendations again, and that's how affected she was by this you know, response from the physician. So with that story, kind of moving into some of the claims here, uh, Kathleen, how are you on time? I just want to adjust on the fly, maybe, if I don't know. Yes, that looks great. So what, what should I wrap up? I'd say in the next 10 minutes, if that's possible. Okay, that's totally possible. Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll move to this quickly. So part of what's going on is pharmacy is expanding its scope of practice. You may have even noticed that just you know in CVS now, there you see flu shots being offered now, and all kinds of other services being offered out of, out of retail and community pharmacies. There's also much more clinical training going on in pharmacy. So as pharmacists' professional territory expands, more and more they are sort of um, sorry, to overlap and go into territories that were traditionally other medical providers' domains. And so that creates natural complications for teamwork, all right, changing role relationships, ambiguous professional territories. My sense of the educational message, at least at my college, is and this is to pharmacy students show your stuff, but know your place. In other words, when you go down these rotations, show the value of pharmaceutical care. Show them that you can make catches. Show them you can optimize medication regimens. Show them that you bring value to the team. That's, I mean, there's a real almost political spirit within pharmacy right now to build the profession and claim more territory. But you have to know your place. We have to do this in a way where we're not ruffling feathers or offending people. All right? and, that, and on the one hand, I want to put that to you as a sort of a dilemma, um, uh, an insoluble dilemma. How can we both show our stuff and know our place? But what I argue in the paper, and, and, and it's a framing that's um, I'm using more and more, is the idea of dialectic tensions. I don't know if that's you know, in your communication training if you've been exposed to that, but it's something that's really appealing to me. I've also seen it um, in grounded practical theory, which is a new sort of theoretical perspective that um, Bob Craig and Karen Tracy have been developing. I really, really like it as a way of looking at it, looking at uh, interaction, frankly. And the idea is that these kinds of tensions and dilemmas are natural and normal in human interaction. There's too much, um, I think, you know, communication work that is that is um, sort of predictive and linear in its aspirations. It says, 
this causes this, causes this, causes this, so do this. If you want X, do Y. And there's nothing wrong with good recommendations, but I think, uh, you know, I'll, I'll put it to you like this, there's, a, there's a, that old saying, um, uh, give a man a fish, give a person a fish, and that person eats for a day, teach them how to fish and they eat for a lifetime. I think that's what dialectic tensions can offer people. It can offer people uh, resources for reasoning their way through professional problems. Um, so in this case, the dialectic tension that we offer is the idea of the tension between assertiveness and deference. And what you need to do is look, learn how to balance these two instincts. The assertiveness piece is show your stuff, get involved, show what pharmacy can do, you know, butt in, make a recommendation, notice a problem, correct that problem. The deference piece is more the know your place part. Don't offend, don't ruffle feathers. So I think there's a natural place for communication scholars to offer strategies that people can use to navigate this dilemma. It's, it's wrong to be fully assertive. If you do that, you're gonna just, you're gonna make some people so frustrated they're not gonna wanna work with you. It's wrong to be fully deferent. If you do that, you're not gonna show your stuff. You can't bring pharmacy expertise to bear. So what are the communication strategies we can use to thread that needle to, and to know when and how and under what circumstances to be assertive or deferent? Communication's got a great answer, uh, or at least the potential to offer great answers to that question. So just move this forward a little bit. Um, I'll just point out that I think one of the, one of the ways that conversational analysis and discourse analysis has conditioned me to look at things is even when I'm working with interview data, I can appreciate things that conversation analysis and discourse analysis get at, which are things like sequence. But it matters what comes first. In fact, haven't we all been in conflicts and really what we're doing in the conflict is trying to figure out who started it? We all want to be like the second actor in these conflicts. You know, well, I didn't take out the garbage because you didn't do the dishes last night. Well, I didn't do the dishes last night because you called me a jerk. Now, you called me a jerk because I insulted you, right? We're constantly looking back to find how somehow they made the first move, right? It's just a simple, glib way to illustrate this idea of our concern with sequences of actions matter, right? So when we think about these recommendations, one of the things that we show in the data is it matters a lot whether a physician has requested the recommendation or whether the pharmacist is bringing the recommendation without having been asked. Right? Think about advice. Actually, there's a lovely literature on advice giving communication. Um, Dana Goldsmith uh, has worked a lot on this um, and worked with Christine Fitch as well. And uh, everything that they say about advice giving in sort of everyday interaction, you can find a variant of it in interprofessional collaboration. Right? So, you know, when you offer advice, you can be seen as saying you're not capable of solving your own problems, you made the wrong decision, right? Even though advice seems like a nice thing to do, advice is complicated, socially complicated. If you don't take my advice, does that mean you think I'm not good enough to offer advice? So we found variations um, of that. Just for time reasons, I'll just quickly point that out, that we actually really did find very different concerns when a physician asked for help and when a pharmacist offered the help unsolicited. It changes the footing, I think, of the recommendation in important ways. Um, I, I will do this one real quick. One of my favorite things I found in this data set is the idea of answering the right question. Physicians will often come with a very specific closed-ended question, but the pharmacist knows it's not the right question. Right? They want to be helpful. So, again, a dilemma. I can give you the information you want. If you want to know the answer to your question, I can give it to you. But it's not going to help the patient, and you're actually asking me the wrong question. Talk about something that's a tricky business to pull off, to tell somebody, like, that's not even the right question you're asking. You're so far off the mark. That's a very hard thing to pull off. Here's a little quick story about um, this is all from a uh, student's perspective. My preceptor actually has said before that physicians will come to you with a question, but sometimes the question really isn't a question. You have to ask questions to kind of narrow down what they're actually asking. I mean, yes, someone can say, oh, if this drug doesn't work, then what's the next drug? Well, and what patient? What meds are they taking? Do they have risk factors? You have to take all of that information and then optimize their whole therapy. Here's a quick illustration of a catch that she made using this idea of answering the right question. She was a new patient to the clinic, so the doctor, it was a resident, brought it to us and was like, hey, here's the patient case, pardon me, and she's using calcitonin for osteoporosis, and it's not agreeing with her. So what other drug can we give her? So I just want to invite you to see that as the closed-ended informational question that it is. Calcitonin doesn't work, what's the next line therapy behind calcitonin? I don't know what it is, but it would be very easy for a well-trained pharmacist to say, oh, okay, it's this, All right? So if you just answer the question, you are still being helpful, but this person knows that something is amiss here, All right? Why isn't calcitonin working? She doesn't want to just answer the question. She wants to turn it into something else. So my preceptor gave that one to me, and then I went through pretty much her whole profile and picked out the big problems. 
After looking into the patient and bringing all the problems together, I thought that they were overlooking one major issue called hyperparathyroidism, which could contribute to anxiety, depression, loss of appetite, diarrhea, constipation, unsteady gait, all of these symptoms she had. Since she was going to multiple specific doctors, there wasn't one person to look at the whole big picture. So I kind of mentioned this to the physician, and she was, and I felt like it was because I was a student, she didn't really take it into consideration and kind of put it to the side. Again, a quick uh, epilogue here. The student took it back to the preceptor with the uh, hyperparathyroidism theory. The preceptor thought the student was on something, so they went to the attending physician, kind of like went behind this residence, over the residence head, which has its own interprofessional complexities about it. But the attending was like, yeah, I think you have it here. Um, and they did the test, and it was. That's what it was. So the student made an outstanding catch that the resident dismissed. Um, in reflecting on it later, the student says, I mean, you don't want to tell the doctors you're doing your job incorrectly. I mean, that's kind of standoffish. And that's why I didn't know how to present it to the doctors. Like, maybe they thought, oh, well, why didn't I think of that? And she is just a student. Like, I don't know. I never like to overstep my boundaries and maybe piss off doctors. And so you can see her struggling with this tension between sort of this indefinite, right? It's, and it's not a question of should I or shouldn't I, it's how. How do I do this? What are the right ways to thread this needle of making the catch and bringing my expertise to bear, but not, you know, pissing off doctors? By the way, when I, when I presented this data at, at the college, all, every pharmacist in the room cringes when they see their student, very professional student, saying things like piss off. Um, they're very big on professionalism, and I understand why they just cringe. For me, actually, as a methodologist, I feel like if I have a, a research participant who's willing to say things like piss off to me, I feel like I'm doing a good job as a researcher making them feel comfortable that they can talk to me and be real with me, frankly, get to the realness of the situation. All right, for time reasons, I really just, I'm really going to jump ahead a bit uh, and talk about one more, one more project that I'm really excited about that I think has tremendous potential in terms of collaboration between pharmacists and communication scholars. And it's, I'll just do it real quick um, so we can leave time for other things. But, Medication therapy management is a huge cutting edge thing that's happening in pharmacy right now. And for me, it's where I want to invest my research energy to study medication therapy management. A bit of background about it. So the Medicare Modernization Act of 2003 included a mandate for medication therapy management services to high risk beneficiaries, such as people who have multiple chronic conditions who are on multiple medications. It's a patient-centered approach to improving medication use and adherence. And it's all, the heart of it is the Comprehensive Medication Review, which is a very rich, uh, it can be in-person or telephonic, I'm studying telephonic medication therapy management, but it's a long, 45 minutes to an hour long discussion about all aspects of a patient's medication usage. That includes prescriptions, over-the-counter, herbal therapies, dietary supplements, and it's done in real time. So, I mean, counseling has long been a part of pharmacy, but the image I think we have when we, when we think about pharmacy counseling is a quick two or three minute discussion in a quasi-public setting at the pharmacy counter. This is trying to be something much, much deeper and richer. It's, it's the most advanced kind of counseling pharmacists have ever done. So for me, with my background in patient provider interaction, kind of that's where I want to be. The CMR for me is incredibly exciting. You collect patient-specific information, try to identify medication-related problems develop a prioritized list of those problems, and create a plan to resolve them. And it really is, the idea is to be collaborative with patients. The idea isn't, all right, here's what you do. Um, take this pill then, take this pill at this point. It's really working with patients. Tell me about your life, how are things? You know, when, when do you have your meals? How can we coordinate your care or your medications with those um, aspects of your life? It's, it's more complicated than that, but I'm, I'm giving you just a sense of it for right now. The goals of the service are to improve patients' knowledge. There's a real educational spirit in MTM to identify and address patients' problems or concerns. So I mean, that's a big part of it, is wanting to find out from patients what is a struggle for them. What patients find problematic isn't necessarily what providers find problematic. And uh, my colleagues tell me that often the biggest thing to a patient is something that they wouldn't even think of, like my pill is too big. That's a big thing for them. Um, I, don't, I can't swallow it. I don't know how to cut it. I mean, you seem like things that are trivial, but those are the very things that can challenge your adherence to these medications. If it's painful to swallow, if you don't know how to cut it, if you're, every time you cut it, half the pill is flinging, you know what I mean? These, are, these seem like small things, but those are the things that are on patients' minds. So if we want to be patient-centered, that's, that's the move. You've got to go to what is a problem for the patient. And there's a strong empowerment move to get them to self-manage their medications. There's various activities I'm studying as part of this project. The recruitment of patients over the phone to participate in the study, kind of cold calling, persuading them to take the service. It is voluntary. 
the medication review itself, as well as some writing that's tied to this, and that's where some of the teamwork stuff comes in, writing to physicians and collaborating with, with physicians about uh, the patient's plan. So lots of communication skills are wrapped up in MTM. There is a MTM service on my campus. It's called the MyMeds Personalized Medication Review Service. It's run by Dr. Jen Cerulli, who, again, is another uh, colleague of mine, buddy of mine. Uh, she directs it. She teaches through it. And she has a budget to do research, which I'm trying to supplement with grant funding. Uh, but she's got all kinds of students doing all kinds of work in there. And it's all about patient interaction um, and also inter uh, interaction with uh, providers through writing. At this point, I've collected 115 patient recruitment calls and 30 comprehensive medication reviews. Uh, actually, I just heard, I'm super excited because I just heard from our transcriber that we've got, you know, these, these need to be transcribed in a HIPAA-protected um, uh, virtual desktop, and I'm not a tech-savvy person, but essentially it's, it's a technological problem to solve to get somebody who's not on campus to have access to the secure database of HIPAA-protected materials. But we've solved it, oh, wonderful. She's going to start transcribing next week, and so I can finally get these data in and start working on them. And I'm just super, super excited. Some of my research questions are what are the recruitment strategies that are effective? That's a huge um, quality measure for the vitality of any of these practices. If you can't recruit patients, you can't do the service. We've got community pharmacies calling us constantly. They know about me, they know the work I want to do there. They're constantly contacting Dr. Cerulli saying, you know, well, we can't recruit, our recruitment rate's like 20%, what can we do? And we just don't have the research ready yet, but it's super exciting to know that this work that I'm going to do it has immediate implications, even locally and regionally. We can start bringing them in, teaching and training them better recruitment strategies, as well as all of the um, activities that go on during the CMR, which is probably the most exciting thing. For me, the big thing is adherence. I think adherence is an incredibly important kind of conversation to have. I think pharmacists are the best position of anyone to have conversations with patients about uh, treatment adherence. And also, I think my background in delicate topics is going to come in handy there. Um, when people aren't adherent, um, it's often for complicated, delicate reasons. I mean, it's not like people are just willfully neglectful of their health care. Right? It's things like, you know, oh, I don't take those pills because there are sexual side effects. And how do I get a patient to talk to me about those things? Right? Um, I don't take those because I'm drinking beers and it says in the bottle I shouldn't mix this with alcohol. Right? I can't afford my meds all the time. Sometimes I have to choose between getting this, uh, this med pill or feeding my kids. Delicate, delicate things to talk about. We need pharmacists who can draw patients out and be non judgmental and comforting to patients, get them to tell them what the challenges are so that we can solve them. Um, again, I'll just quickly say I'm going to use this really exciting new method called conversation analytic role play method. And for me, that's, going to, that's the way to tie the social science of studying these interactions to an educational intervention, which I think is going to be really appealing within pharmacy. Um, and in my experience, they really love communication centered education, but it's not necessarily their training to do those things. And CARM is a really exciting way to do that. Uh, if any of you are interested in CARM, I'll certainly send Kathleen some materials and she can circulate them. I think it's a fascinating way to do. Uh, training of professionals who have to interact with clients. Thanks so much.